the old men. So that should be a lot of fun. And then the next one is, I guess, one grumpy old man and, a, and some nice ladies. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's going to be a lot of fun. The panels are going to be a lot of fun. I hope we have enough microphones for it. We'll arrange it over lunchtime. Okay, I would like to introduce to you our next speaker, Colin Shackelford. Colin joined the uh, Caesar Kleberg Wildlife Research Institute's Texas Native Seeds Program in 2011. Colin was raised in Houston and is a seventh generation Texan with a long family history in Central and West Texas. He received his BA in psychology from Austin College in Sherman, Texas, and his MS in rangeland ecology from Texas A&M University in College Station. Well, we all know where. No. Yeah. <laughs> Colin's work with Texas Native Seeds focuses on the development of native seed sources and restoration strategies for West Texas. Colin's most recent experiences include positions as grant projects manager for the Chihuahua Desert Research Institute, as well as the director of stewardship for the Nature Conservancy's Davis Mountains projects in West Texas. He's worked on grassland and wetland restoration projects on the coastal tall grass prairie of Southeast Texas, as well as Ponderosa Pine Forest and Pinyon Juniper Savannah Restoration in the Mountains and Grasslands of West Texas. Please welcome Colin Shackelford. Okay. Thank you, Meg. I appreciate it. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah? Okay. Okay. Um, just a side note before I get started, uh, going back to Jeff Keeling's uh, presentation. He was, you know, like Meg said, I would, when I first moved out here from my starting my career in West Texas, I was the project manager for the Davis Mountains, the Nature Conservancy project up there. And I was one of the people who Texas Forest Service approached me and they were really wanting to kind of document state champion trees. And I'm kicking myself for the missed opportunity of documenting the state champion Mexican dwarf oak uh, that I really, really wanted to have it officially documented, this towering, vast, giant specimen of an oak that came up to about your waist <laughs> there. So anyway, I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, so anyway, like Meg said, I'm Colin Shackelford. I'm the Associate Director for Texas Native Seeds. I work here in West Texas, based out of Alpine. I cover our project, our West Texas Native Seeds project. Um, I work for the Caesar Clayburg Wildlife Research Institute, which is part of Texas A&M Kingsville. Uh, and, and here regionally, I work for the Institute, but then uh, we partner with different organizations and different regions we work with. Uh, and here in the Trans-Pecos and Alpine, we partner with the Borderlands Research Institute, uh, Sol Ross State University uh, here in Alpine. Uh, so first, kind of just an overview of what exactly is West Texas Native Seeds. Uh, well, basically we have kind of a threefold mission. Uh, the first thing we do is we develop native seed sources, native seed sources specific to the regions that we're working in. So in my case, native seed sources that come from plant populations you find in West Texas geared towards restoration work in West Texas. Uh, we then work with the commercial seed trade to get those plants out to market and available to consumers for grassland restoration all across West Texas. Uh, and then we take those seed sources and then we work with them to develop different restoration strategies and best practices. So basically we're developing a, a, a seed product. We're licensing it to the commercial seed trade so it can be grown at scale and available in large quantities. And then we tinker with it, trying to figure out what are the best ways to do grassland restoration in the varied habitats uh, uh, here in West Texas. Uh, Texas Native Seeds is a statewide program. Uh, we have six different project regions you can see there on the map. Uh, so for West Texas, um, my project area covers basically kind of El Paso, east to about Abilene, south to del about Del Rio and everything in between. Uh, so a very large project area, a really varied project area, um, you know, cover a lot of different eco regions from the southern high plains, southern rolling plains, uh, to the Chihuahuan desert grasslands and the, and the country here in Big Bend, all the way west uh, to El Paso uh, there. And like we're doing with the Borderlands Research Institute here in each region that we work in, we partner with different university or, or, or NGO partners uh, in our work developing uh, seed sources uh, specifically to the regions that we work in. Um, so first, kind of an overview of why, why do we need to develop new seed sources uh, here in West Texas? Um, if you look back at reseeding efforts historically here in the West Texas uh, region, we've never had very good performance 
uh, from a lot of the existing seed sources uh, that were out there. Um, one of the important variables involved with that is that there was a lack of market capacity uh, for regional seed sources out there. They just weren't commercially available at scale. Um, and if you looked at the, the seed sources that were available uh, at the market at the time when we started this in 2011, there was a lack of seed sources developed specifically for use in West Texas, developed specifically from populations of plants you find uh, in West Texas. Um, when we got started here in 2011, at the time, there were only two varieties of seed uh, that were commercially available that were developed from populations in West Texas. One was Van Horn Green Springletop, uh, which was an NRCS release from the Knox City Plant Materials Center, kind of north of Abilene. Uh, that was a, a, from a, derived from a population of Green Springletop uh, close to Van Horn. Uh, and the other seed source that was available was El Dorado Engelman Daisy. Uh, which was from populations kind of west of El Dorado, uh, there north of Sonora. So looking back to seed sources and why we want to do this, if you're going to have a successful restoration project, basically where the seed comes from that you're using in your planting project is very important, critical variable uh, for having a successful project. Uh, for a long time in Texas, looking at, at specifically at the, an example of Cytos grama, that species and what was commercially available at the time. Um, there was only one source of Cytos grama developed from populations in West Texas. That was Haskell Cytos grama. That was a release developed by the Knox City Plant Material Center, came from kind of North Central Texas. Uh, and it was a cultivar release from a population found around Haskell, Texas. Um, now, the, 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 the way that at the time, the, 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 the way you develop plants was working with cultivars. Uh, so basically, that's kind of like, kind of like generating clones of plants. So you had one population of plants you're working with, and then you're making selections of specific plants from within that population. Uh, so you have a, a cultivar, basically kind of quasi cloning the plant uh, there. But it was a good plant. It worked well in North Central Texas. It was a rhizomatous form of Cytos grama. Uh, so it spread really well and, and, and did well in the areas that it was planted in within the area that it was adapted to. Uh, but for a long time, that was the only Cytos grama that was available. It was being planted in South Texas, West Texas, coastal prairie, other areas. And we weren't getting very good performance from it just because the genetics that it was derived from were not adapted to those areas that it was being utilized in. Um, when our South Texas Natives project came along, which was the parent project from which our whole statewide project grew out of, uh, that project's a little over 20 years old now. One of the first species that they worked with was Cytos grama, common range plant across the whole area. Um, but when they developed that, they selected and developed it from six different populations of Cytos grama you find from around South Texas. So it's a very different model from developing a cultivar um, you're making selections at the population level rather than working specifically with one particular plant out of a population. So we're selecting at the population level. So you have genetic variation within that population. And then we're, we're utilizing multiple populations. So you have genetic variation between those different populations uh, that you're working with. It's a the, the ecological concept of within and between. Uh, there. So you're covering a lot of your bases in terms of genetic variation. Well, we got that developed and now we had a seed source that worked well for South Texas, parts of Central Texas, uh, but that still left out a lot of the state uh, in terms of having a variety of seed Cytos grama that, that was suitable for restoration work uh, in other areas of Texas. Um, when we started our work here in West Texas, Cytos grama was high on the list of priority plants we wanted to work with. Uh, so that's one of the first species that we developed and released. Excuse me. Um, we developed our Brewster germplasm Cytos grama from three different populations of Cytos grama we found here in West Texas. One population from kind of the Western Edwards Plateau, you can see in kind of that blue color with the ecoregion lines for it. And then two populations from the Chihuahuan Desert grasslands uh, here in the Trans-Pecos uh, there. And so we're doing the same thing in the other regions that we're working in, in, the, in the, the Panhandle, the coastal prairie and parts of East Texas, getting ecotypic seeds specifically for Cytos grama developed uh, for each of those regions. Um, 
so going back to plant origin and plant performance, where those genetics come from and how that plant is gonna perform in the area that you've planted it in. Um, let's look at some examples of blue grama. Uh, so this is a planting we did here in Alpine uh, of a variety of seed called Bad River Blue Grama. This is an older NRCS release and its origin was in South Dakota. We planted it here in the Transpecos in the Chihuahuan Desert. That plant was used to Northern Great Plains climate, Northern Great Plains soils, it's a plant out of place here. It didn't quite know what to do with itself. It made these weird little topiary ball type things. And I, when it started growing out, I kept looking at it and I was like, do, do we have rabbits in here that are getting after this thing? What is going on with this? But that's all it did. That's all it could do. It was just trying to figure itself out. And it just made these weird little topiary balls uh, there. Um, let's look at a different variety of seed. This is a cheetah blue grama. Uh, this is an NRCS release. It was developed out of populations from South Central New Mexico. Uh, so Chihuahuan Desert habitat, Chihuahuan Desert climate, Chihuahuan Desert soils. Bring it on. I'm fine here. I know this. I know what to expect. And it produced a good vigorous plants, really good high quality seed, performs well in restoration plantings uh, there. Both of those plants were planted at the exact same time in the same soil had the same irrigation water, the same everything. And that's the, that's the best they could do uh, there. Now that's, you know, that's an extreme example, but it illustrates the point uh, that you get better plant performance from plants that are closer to where you are than you will from plants that are derived from populations further away uh, from your site. So that's a little bit about kind of why we're doing this type of work. Uh, in developing seed sources. Now let's talk a little bit about kind of how we do that work. Um, the first thing we need to do is have a drink of water, but we need to figure out and narrow down what plant species we wanna work with. Um, we can't work with them all. It's gonna be impossible. Uh, so we need to be selective and focused on what plants we wanna work with uh, there. So kind of the attributes we're looking for in plants uh, for seed sources for restoration we're looking kind of for generalist species uh, that you find across a range of habitat types. You don't want to work with these plants that are these kind of niche specialist plants uh, that are in, in specialized habitat areas. Uh, that's just not going to work. You could do restoration in these very small isolated areas, but it's not going to be applicable across the broader West Texas area. Um, we want to work with plants that have a broad, uh, gen uh, broad distribution. Uh, across a variety of soils and the whole geography of West Texas. Uh, there is that plant, you find its geographic range, north, south, east, west, uh, across West Texas. And then will that plant adapt into agricultural production? Uh, can you farm it as a crop? Um, does its pollination ecology work okay in an agricultural setting? Is the, the seed set, is it, is it a determinate or indeterminate plant uh, there that you're gonna be able to, to harvest good quantities of seed from? Um, can you clean the seed? Can you store the seed? Is it a seed that's going to have a long storage life where you get eight years into a realistic real world storage environment in a warehouse uh, is that plant germination going to last five years, eight years, 10 years? When are you going to start to see that germination drop off, curve drop off and you start losing seed viability uh, there? If it's something that's going to have a very short shelf life where you start losing significant amounts of germination over one or two years, um, it's really not going to work very well uh, in an agricultural setting. Uh, in the real world of, of selling high quantities of seed. You might do that in specialized markets, but uh, uh, for the most part, it's just not gonna work. And then perhaps most importantly for getting plants out to the general population for use in restoration, is there a commercial market for this plant? Every plant that we derive has to be a successful commercial product or we're not doing our job. If we develop a plant, uh, plant release and have it out there and available, but there's no de commercial demand for it, A, that plant will not be out into the world and part of restoration projects. 
uh, and then the commercial growers that we work with are going to be stuck with a product that they can't move, that they've invested a lot of money in ramping up production uh, for. Um, sometimes it's known that there's uh, going to be commercial demand for it. Sometimes it's kind of our best guess uh, uh, there. But we're developing things with the idea that they can be grown at scale and then sold on this commercial seed market out across the whole region. So once we kind of identify the plants that we want to work with, um, and we're working with a list of plants of a, a, about 60 different grasses and forbs, some of those will be successfully developed as seed sources, some of them won't, we'll just kind of reach some dead ends with them. Uh, but once we identify those, those uh, uh, plants that we want to work with, uh, we go out and start doing plant collections. Um, we have stacks and stacks and stacks of little brown paper lunch bags, uh, and we go out into the world making seed, making seed collections uh, there. Um, you know, one of the first things we do at the beginning of every growing season and into the growing season is we start looking at rainfall maps, uh, and we start priorities, prioritizing areas that we want to go out and collect in. We collect on private ranches and farms, we collect on state parks, wildlife management areas, TNC property, bar ditches on highways, county roads, wherever we can find these seed sources, we'll go out uh, and make collections uh, of them. Um, on the right side there, the state map, you can see uh, that's our collections map up to date. We just finished that two days ago. Uh, so statewide, we have a little over 5,000 collections uh, that we work with. Basically, every single black dot you see on that map, somebody from our program has been out there with a little brown paper lunch bag, frantically trying to keep the wind from blowing all their seed away while they're trying to get it stuffed into a bag uh, there. So once we go through you know, several iterations of collection, several years of collection, we'll come back and then it's like, hey, look at this. We got, you know, we got 30, 40, 50, 60 collections of this particular species. Are we, do you think we're ready to start an evaluation with it? Um, so we'll go back to those collections. We map them. We look, do we, do we have geographic representation of the collections that we have? Are the collections representative of the different soil series that this plant occurs in? Uh, do we have different ecological sites represented? Is, it, is, is our collection geography representative of the whole area there? And, and sometimes we'll map these things out and we'll see some obvious holes in a map. And then we'll say, well, not quite. We need to get back over uh, to the Southern High Plains and get some more collections over there to kind of fill in this collection map. Um, but once we kind of, yeah, you know, we've, we've got a pretty good representation and we've got a good number of collections. It's usually between 30 and 60 collections is about what we're working with for the most part. Um, we'll go ahead and pull the trigger and begin the evaluation process. Uh, the picture is, is of a hooded windmill grass evaluation uh, that we had at our farm site uh, here in Alpine. And, and, and what's involved in that is we go back to those original paper bag collections of seeds. We plant those out in a greenhouse and uh, in trays, grow them out and make little gr gr greenhouse produce plugs. And then we plant those out in what's called a common garden study. Uh, that's kind of the standard for doing plant material evaluation. That's the, the, the benchmark that everybody that does this type of work, that's the, the, the research process you use in doing plant evaluations is the common garden study. So we put together our planting map. It's all randomized with a, a complete randomized block design with multiple replications uh, in the planting. We go out and we plant it. We irrigate our plants until they're established and then we cut the water off. Uh, so that's one of the evaluation criteria is these plants have to figure out a way to make a living on their own. Are they durable plants that can handle some harsh environments uh, there? Um, as these plants develop and mature, we collect seed off of them to do germination testing. Uh, we collect a whole series of data off of it, looking at everything from seed production to biomass production leaf density, looking for really healthy, vigorous plants uh, that are capable of producing a lot of good viable seed uh, there. We collect data off of these for about two years. Um, we'll crunch some numbers, look at things. Um, if things are pretty clear cut, we've got some clear winners that we wanna work with. We'll go ahead and begin to make some selections for plant populations that we wanna develop as part of our seed release. 
Um, if we go back and we look at our data and it's kind of muddy a little bit, it's not as clear cut as we want, sometimes we'll bump a subset of those populations into an advanced evaluation study that we might do for another year or, or maybe another two years. Um, we might look at how do you harvest it, uh, uh, just kind of seed for small scale seed production trials with it, kind of tease out some information, uh, see if this is a population uh, we're gonna work with. Um, but once we have enough information, feel good about it, we make the selections of the plant populations that we wanna work with for, for West Texas. Um, we'll go back to those brown paper lunch bags, those original seed collections, and then we plan out larger numbers of plants in our greenhouse. Usually everything from 2,000 plants to 25,000 plants, uh, depending on the species, depending on how much seed we actually have in our bag uh, to work with uh, there. But basically we plant that out into farm blocks and that is treated as a crop. Uh, we're irrigating that, we're fertilizing it, we're treating it for pests. We're trying to do is get, as, get seed production scaled up for that particular block of that one population, two populations, three populations uh, that we're wanting to work with. Um, seed increase takes about two years, three years. If you catch some good years, you can maybe get away with it two years. If you catch some bad years, it might be four years uh, before you have enough harvested seed, what's considered foundation seed. Uh, that's the foundation seed from which all commercial scale production is derived. And then that's also the seed that you store in your cooler that's your reserve seed uh, for later down the line. Uh, so, but once we get through the seed increase process, we have a good quantity of seed. Uh, we begin the formal release process. We do our plant releases through the NRCS plant materials program. And so at the end of that process, that will be a recognized seed variety. Uh, a select Texas native germplasm is the type of releases that we do. Um, we then work with commercial growers, we license products to them and they begin to scale up. Uh, we go back to that foundation seed, work with the growers, they take that seed and begin to scale up production, uh, usually anywhere from a half acre to a 15 acre block to a 50 acre block depending on the species and what kind of anticipated demand uh, they're gonna have for that. Um, these are, when we got started, these are the first two releases that we got out. Uh, our Permian germplasm whiplash pappas grass uh, and our Santiago germ, germplasm silver blue stem. For West Texas now, we're up to six different plant releases that we have. You get those scaled up to commercial production. This is a big field of Canada wild rye. This is a release we had developed for South Texas. This is Lavaca germplasm Canada wild rye. But you get some big fields like that going, you start to grow a lot of seed product uh, and can get that out to market for a different restoration and reclamation product projects. And so that, that's the, the, that whole process from us standing in the field in the wind, getting seeds in a bag, to getting seeds in a bag at this kind of scale, if everything goes right, that's about a, a five to six year process. But in reality, a lot of things never go right. Uh, so you're probably looking at, at seven to eight years on some of this stuff. It's a long involved, tedious process uh, to, to go from a, a population you found in a pasture on a ranch somewhere to something scaled up in commercial production that's out being sold to consumers and being planted uh, in grassland restoration projects uh, in West Texas. So kind of where we are with our evaluations and releases in West Texas. Uh, so since 2000, starting in 2011, we've completed 26 different plant evaluations. Uh, from those evaluations, we have six different plant releases appropriate for use in West Texas. Those are the ones highlighted uh, in yellow, um, and those are all commercially available now. Um, we finished evaluations and made selections on 11 different species. Those are the ones highlighted in green, meaning those have been, we made selections, they've been bumped up into seed increase, and we're trying to bump up the amount of foundation seed we have in our seed warehouses uh, with the idea that that will be released commercially in the next one, two, or three years uh, there. The release process, especially because we're a statewide program, 
we can't get all this stuff out to market all at the same time. Uh, the seed industry can only take on so many new product lines. It's a big endeavor and a big cost for a grower to take on a new product line. So if I've got one or two releases coming out, but yet all the other uh, project regions we have also have one or two releases coming out, it's a slow methodical process to get all of those releases translated into market because uh, we can very easily overwhelm the, the ability of commercial growers to integrate this into their operation, uh, figure out how to grow it, uh, and then get it out into scale. Um, we've got four species that are currently in evaluation. Uh, those are the ones that are highlighted in blue. Um, those, will, those will have another additional one or two years worth of data collection before we can make selections on, on, on whether we're going to be able to get a release out of it. Um, you see some things that are, that are not highlighted. Uh, those were dead ends for us. Uh, it is just a plant that would not translate into commercial production or just never produced good viable seed. Uh, there in that second column there at the bottom, you see narrow leaf globe mallow. Um, I was really excited about that plant. It's a great plant, um, grows vigorously, produces a lot of seed. It's an important pollinator plant. Uh, for here in the Tri-County area, it's a really important wildlife food source, especially for pronghorn. So as much of a struggle as our pronghorn populations are having, if we could get a good food source uh, for pronghorn out and available, that would have been fantastic. This plant was a nightmare. Uh, it just wouldn't cooperate. Um, we would have good flowers on it. It grew strongly indeterminate. So you would have ripe seed with ripening seed, with new flowers, with flower buds on it all at the same time. They never synced up. So you'd try to harvest seed off of it and you would maybe get 10 or 15% of the available seed at a time off of it. Um, when the seeds develop on this, they develop in these little capsules. Um, and the capsules like to explode randomly. <laughs> um, I would go out in the field and we'd be looking at things and it's like, you know, this is looking pretty good. I think maybe, maybe another three, maybe, you know, go on a Monday. It's like maybe Thursday or Friday. I think we can maybe, maybe actually get a harvest off this. And there'd be a slight change in humidity. And I'd go out there and all those things are just ruptured all over the place. And it's just like, okay, I don't know what we're doing here. Um, the seed we were able to get off of it, really poor seed quality. I mean, goose eggs, we would get seed, do testing on it and have 0% germination off of it on seed collections collected off those plants all throughout the growing season. It's a strongly rhizomatous plant. It reproduces vegetatively. Uh, the, the tendency is for a lot of plants that reproduce vegetatively, uh, the, the trend is, they, the, the general trend is they have very poor seed fill. Because uh, from an evolutionary perspective, if I'm able to just reproduce vegetatively all day long every year, I, I don't need to sink that much energy in developing real, you know, that's a high energy cost to develop really good, high quality seed. So we mess with it for a couple of years and then there's this, um, it's a, a little polymer that you can spray on the plant. So the idea that it would, it would hold these capsules intact and then maybe you could get everything to sync up and then you could combine it. Ah, that didn't work. <laughs> so it was just, you know, not all the plants we work with, they may start out as a great idea, but we may just uh, kind of nosedive the plane into the side of the mountain with it uh, there. Uh, so, so that's kind of where we are with, with our plant evaluations and our plant releases uh, here in West Texas. Um, I had a whole section on how you make seed mixes, but that was, just wasn't going to work. Uh, for time. So this is kind of a, a random slide left over from that section that I just wanted to mention. One of the things we have available on our website uh, is a statewide online seed mix recommendation tool. So if folks have a project they're working on, uh, they can go to this website, they can pull up a, a, a kind of a boilerplate seed mix for the area they're from. So if you just Google Texas Native Seeds Program, that'll go to our website. Uh, on the home page on the left hand side there where the blue circle is it says seed mix map that'll pull up a state map of Texas you click on the region that you're in and it'll zoom in to kind of here like in West Texas uh, and then you click on more or less where you are in the county that your project is at um, and it will pull up two different seed mixes 
Uh, one's a sandy soil seed mix and the other one is a clay soil seed mix. Uh, so like I said, these are, these are kind of boilerplate seed mixes. They'll work in the sites you're working in, but if you want to have a tailor-made uh, 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 seed mix developed specifically for your project, we tell people to just give us a call. We put together seed mixes for people all the time uh, there. So that was kind of the, de the development process and why we do it and how we do it and getting these releases out. Let's look at the utilization of some of these different seed sources in the real world. Okay. So this is a, an experimental planting we did on a pipeline right of way in South Texas. This is down in Live Oak County, planted back in 2012. Basically with this pipeline right of way, we split it in half. Uh, on the left-hand side, we utilize our South Texas natives developed ecotypic seeds, seeds specifically from and for South Texas. On the right-hand side, we told the contractor, no exotic species, but just plant what you normally would plant uh, there. They planted it out. Four months later, this is the result. Um, a healthy stand, good dense native grassland on the left, and then not much happening on the right. That pattern held up two years later. Um, you go out there today, um, you know, that was, this picture is taken in 2014. Uh, you go out there today, that pattern is still held true. You see um, on the, on the, the non-dense side, on the on y'all's right side, uh, there you see, do see some grasses coming up in there. That's all from seed rain coming from the plants adjacent to it. Um, the, the winds aren't working in the favor, the favor for distributing the seed over to that side. The wind's pushing the seed away from that bare ground site. If, if the planting was flipped around, it probably that would have filled in by now with seed rain coming from that, uh, that area. This is in West Texas. This is in Glasscock County which is east of Midland and south of Interstate 20. Uh, this is an area that gets, in, in a good year, gets about 22 inches of rainfall. Um, and this is a, a, a pipeline, a Chinook pipeline that we were able to, to work with. And by complete random chance and accident, we did not plan this, we were able to replicate this experiment. Um, we worked with Enterprise, uh, 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 Enterprise Products, which is a big pipeline company. Uh, and developed a seed mix for them for this, for this pipeline project. And at the same time that they started their project, another company started a, a, a pipeline project within that same right-of-way corridor right there adjacent to it. We had our ecotypic seed mix planted on the left. Their contractors came out and planted it. The stuff on the right we know was planted with native grasses. I don't know much about it. I'm still trying to track down the contractor uh, for it, but it was planted about a week after our planting went in and we have the same kind of results as we did in South Texas. Uh, uh, good healthy native grasses established with utilizing ecotypic seed, not a lot going on on the other side. This is from 2019. This is from 2020, that pattern still held. We're mostly inside the Chinook right of way right here. We have good native grasses going. Um, this is kind of where that split is. You see native plants on the, on the left hand, on the, yeah, the left hand side. And on the right hand side, you see a lot of annual broom weed. Uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's some native plants in there, but it's just real low density, not the same kind of uh, uh, emergence and, and density that we're seeing with our plantings uh, there. So I was, that was just complete luck of the draw that that happened, but it illustrates the same point where that research project uh, we did there in South Texas. Um, this is another pipeline project that we worked with with Conoco. This is on some of their property. Uh, this is in Upton County, uh, due south of Odessa. This is an area that in a good year gets about 18 inches of rain. Uh, this is the Gray Oak pipeline that came through Conoco's property. It was a Phillips 66 pipeline. Um, this is a picture from 2021. Uh, we did the seed mix recommendation for that. That was planted three years before this picture. So that seed sat for three years waiting for the right conditions to come along. And when it popped, it was amazing. Uh, this was one of the most successful project planting projects that I think we've done. The, the plant diversity, 
the basal area, the seed production that was happening out of it was just really unbelievable. Um, uh, same thing, you've seen a lot of onlus bush sunflower, Illinois bundle flower, um, our whiplash pappas grass that's in there, uh, our side oats grama, green sprinkle top sand drop seed, the, everything that we planted was representative in there. Now, just as an aside, people often think of pipeline right of ways as a significant disturbance. Uh, and in the right places, they are. They're a big disturbance on the land. But what's really interesting about the context of this pipeline right of way is this was through a significantly degraded ranch. Outside of that right of way is nothing but tar bush and creosote. It's a significantly degraded grassland. This is the best habitat on that ranch uh, there. And it was facilitated by the pipeline coming through. So the, 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 the pollinator density when we were out there when this picture was taken was unbelievable. It was miles and miles of this linear right of way, just butterflies like you can't believe. You stepped outside of that right of way and there was nothing there. It was just creosote bush and tar bush for as far as you could see. So in the, in the right context and, and the project managed the right way, people can take advantage of some of these projects to actually improve some of the habitat on their ranch. But if you have an existing ranch that has really good habitat on it, maybe you don't necessarily want that pipeline. You might feel differently uh, about it. So context matters. This, these things can be opportunities in, in the right setting uh, there. <clears throat> this is a solar site uh, that Oxy Petroleum uh, developed. Uh, this is in Ector County. This is west of uh, uh, Odessa. Uh, near the town of Goldsmith. Um, Oxy Petroleum put this site in with the idea that they're gonna be utilizing solar energy to power a lot of their petroleum development and, and their leases that are kind of around there. Um, we worked with them, developed a seed mix. Um, they used a contractor to come out and plant, planted it 2019. Um, 2020 had a few plants come up, but a lot of the things that we planted, there weren't in there. This was a lot of kind of weedy annuals that you would have expected to be present already in those soils. You know, got a little bit of rain, but nothing, nothing fancy. Four years after planting in that top picture, everything that we planted popped uh, and it looked just fantastic. So the, 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 the lesson I'm learning in a lot of these West Texas projects is that the, the, the patience is a virtue. Um, you know, you see a lot of plantings like this, and you get a little nervous <laughs> uh, there. This is part of a, a cover crop study that we planted in Upton County. Uh, we planted it in uh, 2021, uh, took this picture this past August. Um, this was a cover crop study where we were, we were integrating different types of cover crops uh, in with our native grass planting. The idea being that let's see if integrating winter wheat or uh, as a cool season grass or, or, or millet as a warm season grass, do those help facilitate the establishment of some of our native plants? Do they inhibit and compete with the establishment of a lot of our native plants? Or is it just a toss up and it doesn't really matter uh, there? We're still waiting on rain. This site just has not gotten rain. And what's really interesting, um, that gray oak pipeline with that really beautiful wildflower emergence in it, uh, that's about three miles as the crow flies from this site. Uh, this is in a little bit different soil, but it just tells you how variable the rainfall can be uh, there here in West Texas. Um, and then just a side note on a lot of these pipeline projects, uh, a lot of people just don't quite understand the scale of some of these things that are, go that are going in. Um, we developed seed mixes for the entirety of this project for enterprise products. Uh, we developed 16 different seed mixes uh, that got planted uh, over, this is from Pecos to Houston, about 650 miles, um, about 8,600 acres worth of planting. Uh, and so, you know, there's the scale of this, just big project logistics, complicated. Um, you tie that back into this, the this seed market side of it. And, and part of it was when this project came up, they called us and they gave us three weeks to put everything together. They had a tight timeline, a tight schedule. They needed this turned around right now. Um, for the seeds that we wanted to work with, we emptied 
the warehouses. There was nothing left after we finished that. And part of it was the season. They, they, this was coming out of fall, hadn't captured a lot of the new spring production yet, but we bought out the seeds for a, a lot of the state of Texas just for this one project. So this isn't the only project that's going in. There's a lot of pipeline projects going in uh, there. There's a lot of different restoration types of restoration projects associated with oil and gas development in the Permian, but that's certainly not the only thing. There's a lot of landowners that want to incorporate uh, increasing quail habitat, uh, restoring areas that have been invaded by brush. There's a significant demand for a lot of native seed. Uh, so the message is this, is that that we're gonna need every single seed producer in the state if we're gonna meet the, the, the real demand of these, pro, of these projects across the state. Because the, the scale of the need is tremendous. As more of these infrastructure projects come online, as more landowners starting to wanna do this, we've really gotta bump up uh, our production uh, there. Um, so that was kind of, the the seeds and in, in kind of real world settings there, and now I want to I want to kind of narrow down uh, to looking at just kind of the tri county area, the, the the Big Bend and some of the unique restoration challenges that we find here, that are a little bit different in other areas of the state we work with, and even really very different in a lot of different uh, uh, different than uh, within the Pro West Texas project area, uh, you know, plant doing a planning project down here is very different than doing a, a planning project like near Abilene, where you're in the Southern High Plains, a different rainfall regime. Uh, there, there are some unique issues and some unique challenges just to this specific area right here uh, and, and getting these plantings to be successful. Um, the first one is rainfall. Doesn't rain much out here. Uh, Y'all came in a fantastic year. Um, at my house, we have 15 inches of rainfall for the year. Uh, got most of that in about a month and a half, two months, uh, though, so things greened up. Um, the combined rainfall for the previous two years was nine inches uh, there. I got seven inches at my house last year. The year before at our farm, we had 1.9 inches of rainfall for the entire year uh, there. So huge swings in rainfall in the total amount and the frequency of rainfall events. Do you get a lot of little events? Do you get just one big giant event? Uh, how is this rainfall distributed across the site, across the region? How is that gonna impact your, your restoration project? Um, we have a lot of degraded sites here in the West Texas. This is, this is a harsh area and in a lot of areas with a history of poor management going back to the, you know, the 1900, early 1900s. Uh, we end up with a lot of degraded soils, have, some of them have significant erosion. Um, even with a moderate amount of erosion, you can lose a lot of organic matter out of those soils. As those soils degrade, you can see changes in soil chemistry. You may have eroded topsoils off and you're now looking at salty subsoils that you're trying to plant into. So some unique soil challenges. Um, and from those degraded soils, you have altered soil water relations. Uh, there. If you had a healthy soil with a lot of, with some plant cover on it and a lot of organic matter, you know, your infiltration rate from a decent rainfall event would be pretty good. You could get water moving in through the soil profile. But if you have a degraded site where you've lost a lot of the vegetation, the soils are exposed to rainfall impact, you've lost a lot of that organic matter. If you look at the very small scale, rainfall is a very violent event. Um, an individual raindrop coming in and hitting exposed soil breaks apart soil structure, it liberates a lot of clays. And so if you have unhealthy soil structure because the site's degraded um, with these rainfall events, you can get kind of structural crusting of the soil and that's gonna impact how much rainfall is actually penetrating through the soil profile. So you may get a quarter inch rainfall event but if you have structural crusting of your soil, not very much of that is actually gonna make it uh, through the soil profile uh, there. And in a lot of areas here, we have completely out of control, scary soil temperatures. Uh, just even under the natural vegetation communities, like what a lot of Lynn Loomis was talking about yesterday, talking about very hot or dry scrub, desert scrub uh, there, the soil, our soils are classified as hyperthermic even when you have an intact plant community there. 
and, and that's in low elevation where you have extreme temperatures where it gets 110, 115 degrees pretty regularly in the growing season. But if you take a degraded site and move it into a more favorable site like here around Alpine, if you have exposed soils, a degraded plant community, you can still get significantly high temperatures, soil temperatures, and that's gonna impact how your plants are gonna be able to perform. You know, everybody knows this. Uh, we have uh, uh, a lot of variability in rainfall in, in Texas, uh, moving east to west. Uh, uh, there, it, it, depending on where you are in the state, rainfall can forgive a lot of land management sins. Uh, you can have a pretty degraded site in north central Texas, um, and you know you can lean on rainfall for the most part to kind of help you along when you're trying to restore a degraded site uh, there. We don't really get enough rainfall to forgive a lot of sins uh, here. Those sins tend to persist. Um, this is a restoration project in, in North Texas that our folks in this, our Central Texas project region were working on. This is an old fallow cotton field. Um, about 38 inches of rain in a, in a good year, a uh, little bit of prep work, make good seed source selections, boom, no problem. You got beautiful tall grass prairie coming up. In Duval County in South Texas, 26 inches of rainfall in a good year, about 10 inches less rainfall than North Texas. Do the right kind of prep work, make your good seed selections, boom, no problem. Look at that. Reeves County, Trans Pecos, north of here near Balmeray, about 14 inches of rainfall in a good year. And this is important. This is in a salty bottomland ecological site. So look at there. We got, you can see plants. They're in our drill lines. They're coming up. I was optimistic driving up. I was like, oh, look at that. You can see that you can see our drill lines. That's pretty cool. Uh, every, every one of those plants is dead. Uh, they're, they're dead. Uh, salts, salts. Um, this was a site uh, near Lake Balmeray. The landowner, this, this was completely covered up and almost closed canopy, as, as much of a closed canopy mesquite stand as you can get in West Texas. The landowner wanted to put part of this into alfalfa. They do a lot of alfalfa production in Balmeray. And then they wanted to put in native grassland for bird habitat. So it kind of split, split half and half. So they came in and for their, for their mesquite control, they came in and root plowed a lot of this. And then for pre preparing for their alfalfa fields, you got to do a lot of land leveling, building of berms and dikes uh, there. They used you know, a lot of graders. And, and so there's a lot of mechanical mixing of soil horizons. So what you had, what were salts that were deposited lower down that over time, you know, a lot of these dry sites are just naturally very salty. But with rainfall and time, those salts move through the soil profile and move out of the soil horizon through the rooting zone uh, for the most part. And you can grow plants in there. I mean, right adjacent to this area in the same soils, in the same ecological site, we had alkali sacatone, we had giant sacatone, we had whiplash pappas grass, salt grass, a lot of the halophyte, the salt tolerant uh, uh, plants. And so I really expect, you know, I, I put the seed mix together leaning towards salt tolerance. And I really thought, well, this will, this will be pretty good. We're actually having a decent rainfall year. Things, things will be pretty good. But no, it was the, the mechanical mixing of a lot of those salts. So I said that rainfall can forgive a lot of land management sins. Um, th those sins would not be forgiven in a very quick period of time over this. Uh, this is such a dry site. You, you move those soils, the salts, very slowly through the soil profile. So this would take years of good rainfall to really get the, those salts pushed down uh, there. It's a, it's a common practice to do soil uh, uh, farm flooding in a lot of salty sites like the Imperial Valley uh, there, uh, but we're not able to do stuff like that. Um, salts are really hard to work with. Um, they, the, the soil structure is significantly altered from salts. The salts are almost kind of, the soils become kind of powdery. There's just really poor structure to them. And then the, the soil matrix potential, uh, which is, is how when water infiltrates into those soil profiles, how tightly bound up is the water to salts and to clay particles? So with these salts here, you have very, very high soil matrix potential, meaning the water is there, but it's, 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 it's electrostatically bound up 
in the soil and is not available. The plant doesn't have enough energy to pull it. So the soil may be there. You know, we had good rains on that site, came through and filled. I was like, this is wet, but it's not available to the plant. So it's a, so it's a real challenge. So degraded sites like this are just a real challenge. Uh, they're, they're a real challenge out here. Uh, in a lot of ways in a degraded enough site because who's in charge of the ecological processes that are happening on that site? You know, if you have a good functioning plant community, the plants are cycling resources, moving organic matter down, helping control water infiltration, building good soil structure. Um, if you degrade a site in a, in a climate like this, you're moving control to the larger scale processes, the abiotic processes. So you're looking at climate, hydrology, geomorphology. Those are the large scale processes that are driving the ship on a lot of these really uh, degraded sites. So, you know, I have a site like this. This is in the high country in the Davis Mountains, beautiful native grassland, uh, good plant production, good plant cover. Uh, that's big blue stem right there uh, that my technician Jameson was covering. It was a, one of the few populations of big blue stem we found in the Davis Mountains uh, there. But if you look at that, there's plants everywhere. So the ecological processes are being controlled on a small scale. The plants are in charge of cycling of things. You're still having to deal with climate and geomorphology and hydrology, but the plants kind of buffer some of that. And so they build resilience uh, into that site. It can take some punishment because he has control of the biological resources. You get to a site like this, ah, this is, this is climate and geomorphology uh, in charge here. Uh, this is that cl closer to El Paso. This is a, a copia sand soil, uh, deep sand ecological site. Uh, this was, in a, this was in, in, in a functioning, this was a native grassland. So blue grama, mesa drop seed, sand drop seed, giant sacatone, uh, uh, squirrel tail, a, a lot of species you would expect a little further west. But because this is a, a challenging site, a really erodible site with these sands, once you start to degrade that in a vulnerable site like this, when you get mesquite invasion into it, it doesn't take much to tip it over the edge uh, and to lose a lot of that resilience. Uh, this is gonna stay like this forever. Uh, there's no amount of intervention that we can do that's going to change anything like that. It would just cost way too much money, be a complete waste of resources. Uh, so that's, that's there forever. Um, this is in the north part of Pecos County. This is in a degraded Sodic soil site uh, close to the Pecos River. I have had a lot of erosion. That's a mesquite stump. Uh, and that's a younger mesquite stump. So we'd already had erosion happening when this mesquite established itself. And then we had even more erosion on top of that. So you're down to salty subsoils, abiotic processes are driving a ship, uh, not much happening there. South Brewster County, this is close to Big Bend National Park. You have some highly erodible soils. This is wind erosion uh, there. Uh, so a uh, challenging site to work with, a lot of erosion. This is in South Pecos County, a severely overgrazed site. Um, I've been driving by this ranch for 18 years. Uh, and I see this ranch and it's degraded. You have an altered plant community, but I look at that and I'm optimistic because you, you can see there's organic matter there. There's something that you can work with uh, there. So I think if the right type of restoration was put in right there, you might be able to actually do something. So looking at all these sites, looking at the challenges that are here that are unique to this area, I think we really need to rethink how we do seed-based restoration uh, in this area. Uh, a lot of the practices that we use, like up near Abilene, they work great there, but they might not necessarily translate uh, to this part of the world. Um, usually we would think about large scale projects, 50 acre, 100 acre, 1000 acre, 8000 acre type projects. I think we need to rethink the scale at which we operate and move things down to a smaller scale. Um, we need to look at process based restoration. I was talking about abiotic processes where geomorphology, hydrology comes screaming through an area. The thinking process based, you want to intervene where you kind of stick your foot out and trip it up a little bit and maybe try to use that process to your advantage. And I'll show you a couple of sites for that. And then we need to be more strategic about the sites that we pick to actually do restoration on. We can't do them all. So we need to kind of maybe think about how we intervene in strategic sites and some sweet spots that might be easier to get restored. 
And then we need to integrate seed-based restoration with additional restoration techniques if we're gonna have any kind of success with it. Um, this is in South Brewster County, 14 inches of rain, close to the National Park. This is a project that Lalo Gonzalez with Borderlands Research Institute has been working on. The idea being that we're, we're utilizing these wattles and doing banded planting. Uh, the wattles of the idea being that they intercept runoff, they absorb water, they hold water in the soil and they create a more positive microenvironment for a longer period of time than if the soil was just bare. And then you do it in these bands. Uh, uh, a lot of vegetation, Lynn talked about this yesterday some, but a lot of vegetation here uh, is banded vegetation. Uh, integrating different things in that uh, brush piling uh, can actually uh, alter your, your hyperthermic soils, cool them off, provide a little more positive microenvironment. We got a little bit of rain and see some plants coming up around that wattle. Um, this is another technique used for hydrologic restoration. This is installing trincheras. Uh, this is in the Alameda Creek uh, drainage. The idea being that you're intercepting resources and capturing them and building up a degraded riparian area. And let's see if this is gonna work. There we go. So we're upstream of a trinchera. This is another project that Lalo Gonzalez has been working on. And now we're walking to our trinchera and we're looking upstream. That was the resources that was accumulated after one rainfall event. That tells you how dynamic the erosive processes were and, and were in that site. So you build these trincheras, build them, build them, build them, and, and you capture soil, you capture water, and you build, begin to build up that local uh, water table, and you can integrate seed-based restoration on top of this type of project. Same type of thing, a little bit different methodology. This is in Jeff Davis County. This is in Sienega Creek. Uh, these are called leaky brush weirs or beaver dam analogs, and there's a lot of different names for them. Real simple, uh, easily to, easy to replicate type te te technology. Just drive a bunch of posts into the ground across a degraded stream. You kind of weave brush in between it with the idea being that you're moving water through there and you're slowing it down. You're not wanting to stop it. You're wanting to increase the resident time of that water. So it's infiltrating, you're building up your local water table, you're accumulating soil resources and you start to get things happening like this. And then you put them in series. You can see there's one additional one upstream. Uh, these are low tech things that, are, that, that help restore hydrology to these degraded riparian areas. The idea, idea being we can, once you get a little process happening, positive things happening in the site, we can come in and do seeding work with a better water table uh, there and, and then work our way out uh, from the sweet spot that we're building. Some additional ideas we're talking about building, uh, planting out refugia or seed source islands, these kind of intensively managed small areas that we fence off and even irrigate. The idea being that it's accumulating resources, but it's throwing seed out all around you. And then time and luck uh, will help kind of maybe move some of that forward. Soil pitting or mechanical disturbances like media lunas, something that will help slow down and capture water. Uh, something you can't do in every soil texture. If you have a, like a silty soil, it's all just gonna collapse on you. So you have to be selective about what type of soils you work in. Incorporating organic amendments into some of these things. If you have a low degraded site with little organic matter in it, how can we incorporate organic matter? Nurse crops, do we come in and plant uh, uh, like a winter wheat or a millet one year before, get that established and then come back and plant into that? We're developing a lot of new research project, research partnerships to kind of help answer these questions. My big dream is the everything experiment where we throw everything that we know what to do in this big full factorial massive nightmare exper experiment for some poor PhD, uh, but try to get some of this stuff figured out. But the idea that I have is we want to take all this stuff and we want to, we want to fail early and we want to fail fast. We wanna get our mistakes out of the way because we're gonna make a lot of mistakes, but let's hurry up and get them out of the way so we can actually develop some good information uh, and get it out there to landowners 
and, and help facilitate restoration in this kind of this unique area of the, of the Big Bend uh, there. These are a lot of the West Texas partners that we work with to support our project or our partners in the research that we're doing uh, there. We, we wouldn't have gotten very far in the world without the partnerships that we've developed uh, with a lot of different organizations uh, there. So that's kind of the quick and dirty of plant material and trying to figure out how to plant stuff uh, there. Oh, that was great. Thank you so much, Colin. Sure.